Well, good morning, everyone. It's truly amazing. The crowd just quieted down as we were approaching the, the starting point of this session, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome you to the Regional Administrator uh, Senior Industry Executive Session, and, uh, and I hope you will, um, I hope you've come prepared to ask questions and hear a lot of good dialogue on a number of important issues uh, that are facing us in terms of uh, implementing regulatory programs. Um, I wanted to start off with a few housekeeping reminders for you. Um, <clears throat> of course, questions and answers uh, will be handled uh, via written cards. Of course, you um, would have had to become with host this, at this point in the RIC to not to know that we're handling uh, questions and answers in that way, uh, so there are no microphones. I would ask uh, that you uh, pass uh, questions and answers uh, when you have them uh, to the folks who will be walking up and down the aisles. Um, unanswered questions uh, will no longer uh, be collected and answered and made available on the RIC web website. So if, in fact, there is a question and you haven't gotten an answer, I'd ask you to, after the session's over to make your way forward and we'll stick around, try to stick around, uh, if we can, to answer any questions that uh, may be uh, lingering, but also uh, invite you to send us an email and we'll try to deal with them uh, in that way as well. Of course, your feedback is very important to us. Uh, the technical session and uh, overall evaluation forms are available electronically um, by scanning the QR code <clears throat> accessible on signage throughout the conference center uh, at the kiosk and or via links on the NRC uh, on the RIC website. So again, we do uh, very much want to uh, get your feedback on this session. The real purpose of this session, I think, is for us, uh, as I indicated or alluded to, uh, to tee up questions and, and, uh, and then to get some uh, answers and, and engage in some dialogue with respect to issues um, that uh, are of relevance to us. Um, so I've come prepared, we've come prepared uh, with answers or to, with questions and hopefully uh, some good answers to those questions based on uh, interests that we know exist um, uh, among, uh, among the industry, for example. And so I'll start with those questions. Um, but again, we really do uh, invite you to raise questions, so I really am asking you to actively engage and, and fill out the question cards. Let me, before we begin, introduce uh, or just uh, really just give the names of our panelists. I know uh, that you are familiar with all of these individuals. So Dan Dorman, a regional administrator from Region 1, Kathy Haney, a regional administrator from Region 2, Cindy Peterson, a Region 3 regional administrator, um, Mark DePaul, Region 4 regional administrator, Fadi Dia, who is a, as the Senior Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer uh, for Ameren, and Tim Rausch, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer for Talon. Um, so again, we've got a very uh, distinguished set of panelists and who are well equipped uh, to answer the questions. And so we look forward to the, the question and answer session. I want to, to begin uh, to, to get us going. Uh, turn to a question that relates to uh, treatment of low significant safety significant issues that potentially impact um, operability. Uh, and for context, uh, as you're well aware, uh, the NRC regulations and plant specific uh, operating, licensing, uh, operating licenses, including technical specifications, establish requirements for structures, systems, and components to ensure uh, that plant operation does not pose an undue risk to public health and safety. And when a degraded and non-conforming condition associated with one of those structure systems and components uh, is identified, a prompt evaluation uh, needs to be conducted to determine if equipment can continue to perform uh, its intended safety function. So recognizing when equipment is in a degraded and non-conforming condition and then conducting a timely operability determination is a critical aspect of a licensee's safety responsibilities. Now, all of that is a, a long-winded context to get to some specific questions that we're going to ask. Um, for the NRC, Mark, um, the industry contends that inspectors continue to challenge the operability of structures, systems, and components that perform a function in response to very low probability events or that are associated with low risk significant non-conforming conditions such as minor vulnerabilities to external events like tornado generated missiles, uh, seismic events and flooding. 
and that this has resulted in licensee entry into shutdown action statements associated with the plan's tech specs that is not warranted by the significance of the issue. And, and so the question is, what's the NRC's perspective and, and what action is the NRC taking to address those issues? And before you answer, Mark, I want to also tee up sort of the parallel question for Fatty. The NRC continues to identify examples across the regions where licensees have not recognized that a degraded or non-conforming condition uh, exists and or initiated timely operability determination to ascertain whether degraded or non-conforming equipment can still perform its intended safety function. And this is not, uh, this concern is not limited to low safety, uh, significant or low probability events um, or degraded or non-conforming conditions, but rather it, the, the NRC observed trend applies to a broad range of risk significant equipment um, prescribed in the plan's test technical specifications. And so, Fatty, I want to know from you, do you share that perspective and, and what's being done about it? So let's start with an answer from Mark. Thanks, Mike. Just a couple uh, things that I wanted to add to provide some additional context uh, regarding the operability determination process uh, before I speak more specifically to what we're doing as an agency uh, to uh, define how best to approach addressing uh, low risk significant uh, uh, non-compliance uh, issues. Uh, as everyone know, as many of you know, uh, when you have an inoperable, or I should say a degraded or non-conforming uh, condition of a structure system or, or component, uh, you have to assess uh, whether that particular piece of equipment is able to perform its intended safety function as defined in the current licensing basis. And for those of you that aren't fully familiar, what do we mean by the current licensing basis? It's that set of NRC requirements uh, applicable to a specific plant, plus uh, the licensees docketed and currently effective written commitments for ensuring compliance. So there's a two-step process that licensees use uh, when they need to conduct an operability determination to determine whether a specific piece of equipment uh, that is described in the technical specifications can still perform its intended safety function. That first step is an immediate operability determination, which is conducted by the uh, operating shift uh, uh, on uh, duty at the time. And then uh, many times there may need to be a more detailed uh, 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 analysis that needs to be conducted as part of the uh, prompt operability determination. Uh, the, the operability determination process is purely uh, deterministic in nature. It, you know, you basically have to answer the question, is the structure system or component meet all aspects of the current licensing basis, including all postulated initiating events, uh, based on the best available information uh, at the time of discovery? Uh, you're, it, it's, you're not allowed to bring probabilistic risk assessment into that process because uh, probabilistic risk assessment, uh, when it looks at the probabilities of occurrences of accidents uh, or external events, is not consistent with the assumption that the event occurs and is therefore not acceptable for making uh, operability uh, decisions. However, the PRA results uh, can be used for determining the safety significance of structure systems and components, and that plays into the timeliness of when you need to complete the prompt operability determination and timeliness of corrective actions. So with that, uh, let me uh, talk about uh, how we are approaching uh, this issue. Uh, when you look at our enforcement policy uh, in the description of adequate protection standard, there's reference to the NRC having the authority to exercise discretion to permit continued operations despite the existence of a noncompliance, where the noncompliance is not significant from a risk perspective and does not, in the particular circumstances, uh, pose an undue risk to public health and safety. Uh, when noncompliance uh, with NRC requirements occurs, the NRC must evaluate the degree of risk posed by that noncompliance to determine whether immediate action is required. So in that context, the process that the staff envisions and is working with the industry uh, to more fully uh, formulate involves developing that risk-informed process that would ensure that the level of licensee and staff resources applied to a noncompliance issue correlate to the potential risk and safety significance of the issue. Uh, the staff envisions uh, that this approach would first uh, focus on evaluating the risk significance of the noncompliance. Uh, if the risk significance is determined to be low, then the staff interaction with the licensee uh, would focus on establishing a reasonable timetable for corrective action by the licensee combined with implementing appropriate interim compensatory measures that would maintain adequate safety while the corrective action is being taken. 
Uh, the approach would include enforcement discretion, potentially for a long duration, uh, to provide the licensee adequate time for implementing uh, corrective action. And that approach is envisioned to be an improvement over the current practice and that it would eliminate the need for urgent actions, which is necessitated by entry into short duration technical specification action statements that are taken for low risk significant compliance issues. So let me tell you the status of that particular effort. Uh, there was a public meeting with industry back on February 3rd. Uh, and some key items that resulted from that meeting uh, were industry is interested in this initiative. There's high industry, industry interest. Uh, the industry proposed that we hold a workshop to provide a better definition of the, uh, project, uh, of, the, of the project statement. And this would help identify issues that would be candidates for the new process. Uh, we, you, at that workshop, there would be the desire to work through some uh, uh, sample issues, both NRC and provided. Uh, to see how the process might work. And there are a number of questions that still need to be answered. Uh, what's the pedigree required for a licensee's uh, probabilistic risk assessment? Uh, does the low risk have to be quantitatively demonstrated? Uh, if, quantita if quantitative, where do we set the bar for low risk, i.e., you know, what is the threshold for issue inclusion? Uh, and I'll give you an example of what I think is a, a clear uh, issue that has low uh, risk significance but represents a non-compliance issue, and, and this is an issue that has been identified at some sites in Region 4, and that's when you have electric cabinet doors that are open for some period of time. And, you know, we've had inspectors ask, where is your operability determination to address the seismic vulnerability? Well, obviously, the probability of a seismic event during that limited period of time that those doors are open because there's maintenance activities being performed um, you know, would dictate is there a better approach there than you need to immediately, uh, you know, declare the equipment inoperable and enter the associated tech spec action statement or, in, or uh, initiate uh, uh, compensatory measures. There is at least one non-governmental organization that has engaged us uh, questioning the advisability of this proposed process and the staff is uh, proposing an answer uh, to that uh, challenge. Uh, next steps going forward. Uh, we'll be working with the industry to plan the workshop. Tentative dates, we're looking at uh, late March to mid-April. And then uh, following the workshop, uh, there would be a procedure that's drafted and routed internally uh, for concurrence. Uh, there would be briefings of management as appropriate. And then there, uh, we'd hold a public meeting to share with the industry uh, and obtain feedback from both the industry and the public uh, regarding this proposed approach. Uh, the goal is to have a process we can pilot uh, by the end of the year. So those, that's what we are uh, working on right now to address uh, those issues that involve very low risk significant, uh, 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 low probability of occurrence of the uh, initiating event that would require that equipment to be operable. So uh, that, that's where we are and uh, uh, look forward to any questions you might have uh, when we have that opportunity here about this initiative. And uh, from a, an industry perspective, uh, we do share uh, uh, the acknowledge and share the perspective that uh, we do need improvement uh, in, in operability determination. We need to improve our performance and operability determinations. And one of the actions we're taking as an industry is to uh, develop a guidance document uh, for, for operability determination process. And, uh, and uh, a focus of this uh, guidance document really is to do a, um, uh, provide clarity, uh, refocus, make sure we're, we're uh, getting back to basics, uh, and focus on, on safety and, and simplicity. Um, energy, uh, Tom O'Connor is the sponsoring chief NICAR officer for this guidance document. And uh, we started this effort last winter, and we expect to issue it uh, for comments uh, by August of this year. And also we expect to have uh, this guidance document uh, for NRC, the enforcement, uh, NRC endorsement by the end of the year. Um, that's one of the actions we're taking. Also, other actions we're taking is that we do share with each other. One of the great things about our industry and one of the strengths of our industry is that uh, we are uh, readily um, uh, to, ready to jump in and help each other, uh, ready to jump in and share with each other. So as we have issues with operability determination, we share that operating experience among each other and we learn and we get better as a result of it. And also, we have been conducting training and educating our people on making sure that we continue to improve our performance. And as we issue this document, we will have additional training and education to make sure we continue to improve our performance in this area. Um, we do acknowledge and, and, and uh, uh, agree that it is very important that we keep uh, open dialogue with the NRC 
in the development this in this guidance as well as in addressing this issue and making sure that we continue to improve performance. At the end of the day, uh, uh, our focus is the, the safe operation of our nuclear energy facilities and protecting the health and safety of the public, and that's what we're focusing on. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's turn uh, to a different question. Uh, this question relates to the significance determination process, and I'm going to ask um, that Cindy and Tim uh, take this question on. Um, the context of the question is that uh, we've had some runtime, obviously, with the significance determination process. Uh, the, the, the program, the REACT oversight uh, process is mature, uh, 15 years of implementation. Um, yet, in 2014, we conducted an examination of the SDP to figure out if there were ways that we can improve that process. Um, and we established a working group. That working group has conducted a look at uh, the significance determination process. And in fact, that working group has identified four major areas of enhancements, um, including uh, revisions to the SDP performance metric, uh, implementation of an inspection, findings re uh, inspection finding review board, uh, use of integrated risk decision making, and improved interaction with licensees. And so the question that I want to tee up for, for both uh, Cindy and Tim is, what do you see as a primary challenges to the effectiveness and the efficiency of the significance determination process? And what are your thoughts about how we could or should address them? Cindy, do you want Thanks, to Thanks, Mike. Good morning. As we always like to do, we always like to examine our processes. And so this is no different uh, that we're looking at the significance determination process. And we certainly have believed it to be effective. But in this time, uh, I think we all are looking at ways we can be more efficient. Faster and with less, less resources is always, uh, is always a good goal. So that's, that's where we are. And we're looking primarily on the timeliness piece of it. And we do have a history of, well, I'll say a few outliers, uh, where it's taken us more than a year to come to a resolution of what the significance of a finding has been. So we're looking heavily at timeliness. And it's important that we're timely because we have a, a desire to certainly be assessing current licensee performance. It's important that we communicate with our stakeholders uh, what our assessment is. And it certainly influences, actually, it, it dictates some of our further inspection activities. So it's important that that's being done in a timely way. In general, it does not impact corrective actions. The licensees take corrective actions upon identification of an issue. But on rare occasion, there could be an associated corrective action that follows the final determination. So for those and other reasons, it's important that we try to improve our timeliness while still maintaining the quality of our, our decision making. So a few of the things that the working group is looking at, and I'll let you know there's a full discussion of this tomorrow at a 1030 session here at the RIC. So uh, plug their, your attendance at that one as well. Uh, but the, the uh, working group is looking at a 255-day start to finish of our um, determination process. And that changes our start on the front end of our metric, where uh, sometimes we have done a fair amount of assessment or inspection work before the clock starts. We're now looking at starting the clock at maybe there's an event that is driving the finding or maybe there was something in the corrective action program or some other form of inspection. So we'll be starting that 255-day clock earlier. There will always be a few exceptions. We recognize some complex issues may take longer than that, but that's what we're shooting for. Um, we're also looking at increasing senior management involvement earlier on our part. Mike made reference to a review panel that would be led by a division director is, is what's being considered currently to really ensure we have that engagement of the senior NRC manager up front. That then could lead to a dialogue between NRC senior manager and licensee senior manager earlier in the process. But I think one of the main issues and one of the biggest challenges for us, and I'm very interested in, in Tim's perspective on this, is the amount of information we get and we receive from the licensee, when we get it, how we assess it, and how much is there. Um, we're certainly not intending to create research projects out of every finding. And, uh, you know, there's this balance we all have been struggling with in how much information, when do we get it, how it's assessed. 
um, before we get to a final conclusion. So I think that um, in our maintenance of the quality of the decision is a big uh, thing that we need further dialogue with, with our stakeholders on and ensuring we get the right amount of information to make the right decision. And it'll be critical that it's not only the inspection staff that's interacting uh, with the licensee, but our risk analysts, both in the NRC and the licensees as well. Uh, we have heard that there is a concern uh, that we may use more qualitative factors through our Appendix M process, and Appendix M refers to Manual Chapter 0609 that defines our significance determination process. Uh, our past has been about 13% of our cases have used Appendix M, so it's not a large number. Actually, many of those also were an external flooding. Uh, hopefully, our external flooding findings uh, will be on the significant decline based on all the work industry and the NRC has done. But that was a case where we didn't have an SDP that well fit, so we needed to use Appendix M. Um, but the new uh, streamlining process um, has not a, a defined outcome of whether we will or won't use qualitative factors more. But there is a separate look being done at Appendix M. Uh, to look at our entry conditions for use as well as the guidance. So that's a parallel path, but they do certainly intersect. Uh, the next steps are further public uh, communication and information and engagement on the process. And also we are planning to pilot uh, whatever change process we have uh, yet this year in 2016. And again, more discussion tomorrow at the 1030 session. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Tim? Yes, um, well, I think from our perspective, the most important thing that we have to preserve is we've got to get it right, right? So um, we fully support and, and uh, embrace the efficiency that we're trying to, to get out of the process, and we realize that that's uh, going to be uh, important for the licensee to have a, a, uh, a change in, in behavior and action to, to supply the data more efficiently to the regulator and then the process uh, well, that, that would feed the shorter process, the most more efficient process. Um, we, we look forward to the, to the draft documents to look at those and, and uh, provide our input uh, to the process as it's being built. Um, we are cautious about uh, increasing the use of the qualitative uh, uh, information. So, you know, as you said, uh, the Appendix M is being looked at uh, and uh, I think that's an, a very important part of this is to make sure we get that right because uh, we don't want to risk the quali go to the qualitative piece just to speed the process but not get it right. So uh, the, we do have some ca some caution or um, reserve feelings on that. Um, I do like the idea of the uh, inspection board or you know the the um, uh, inspection finding review board. I think that's going to bring some consistency and some um, rigor. Uh, to the process that that will not only help ensure the quality is there, but also uh, the sooner that that is acted upon, uh, it feels like that would really uh, help motivate the process to go to go a little bit more smoothly. Um, I think we need to. There, there was some discussion in previous conversations about how this would be rolled out too, uh, and. Uh, I think uh, our, my opinion on that is we had to use case studies or, or test examples, if you will, um, versus rolling out the, the modified program and applying it to, real, to actual findings. Because since we're uh, manipulating that process for, for efficiency, um, and we're, if we were to be dealing with someone's real findings, we may not get it right, uh, you know, while we're working our way through that pilot program. So. Uh, I, I would be interested in uh, supporting, however we can, from a licensee standpoint, more of a uh, tabletop or a, um, a test case kind of uh, validation of the revised process versus uh, using the actual findings. So <clears throat> um, I'm very interested in it. We're very interested as, as the in, in the industry. Um, we understand that our part of it is going to be to turn that data around more efficiently. Um, and um, we look forward to reviewing those documents and moving forward. Thank you, guys. So let me just ask, I was, I'm curious, um, given the topic, how many people have uh, been physically or, or have um, been directly touched by Appendix M? Know what we're talking about with respect to Appendix M? Just raise your hands. Okay. And then how many people have been satisfied with that experience? I wanted you to keep your hands up. 
<laughs> yeah, so, okay. All right. Okay. All right. I just wanted to do that. I was looking at the guys over and to the right of me who are working on uh, making that process better. So I wanted them to have that that visual. Um, good work. I should point out that the commission has directed that uh, as a part of changes that we might make to the SDP that we would pilot them. So we are we are uh, going to be moving forward in a thoughtful way, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, work that we would do on. Uh, improving our consideration of, um, I, I guess I would say integrated risk, I guess is how I would refer to that particular piece of that process, improvement. I want to shift gears now and talk about uh, Fukushima, post-Fukushima. Um, obviously, uh, we've had already a lot of discussion at, in uh, various sessions on uh, Fukushima. Of course, Friday uh, marks the fifth anniversary of the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, and I, you know, by the end of the year, most plants will uh, certainly uh, have completed implementation of extensive modifications and procurement of mobile uh, equipment and, and, and other actions uh, to, to significantly improve, I would say, the safety of U.S. Uh, plants to be able to deal with a similar sort of an accident. Um, the inspection uh, activities that we are planning are beginning to, to, uh, to crank up, if you will. Um, we're conducting inspections throughout the year, and we'll be conducting inspections next year. And so uh, just a question for Dan and for uh, Fatty. Um, Dan, first, uh, the NRC's, um, what is the NRC doing to ensure uh, that the inspections of the Fukushima-related enhancements are conducted in a manner that recognize the differences between the design basis and, the, and beyond design basis? That's the first part of it. But also, how do we uh, promote uh, consistency and predictability in this area. So Dan will take that question. And then Fatty, uh, what plans does the industry have to share lessons learned? Uh, and, and particularly, um, lessons learned uh, based on what comes out of NRC inspections as we go forward. So Dan, you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so a, a little bit more context. Uh, in, in March of 2012, the Commission issued orders to all licensees. Uh, you've heard a lot about the FLEX program or mitigation strategies that the, the, the industry calls it the, the FLEX program. Uh, the other order was the spent fuel pool level instrumentation that would provide indication of level all the way down to top of fuel. Uh, and provide remote indication to assist operators in, in, in an accident to ensure that the, the spent fuel was adequately covered and cooled. Uh, and, and these orders were required to be implemented by the second refueling outage after the guidance was issued, uh, and, and by, uh, in, in no circumstances greater than, later than uh, December 2016. So most uh, licensees, most units have completed this work. Uh, some sites or multi-unit sites are, are, uh, have their second, second unit or the last unit at the site completing the implementation uh, either this spring in the outage or in, in outages in the fall of 2016. But enough of them have completed that we have started to do the inspections. Uh, the, the question of how do we uh, you know, the, the, the flex strategy is, is a, as the question indicated, a beyond design basis activity. Uh, it's not subject to uh, the, the uh, treatment of the, of the equipment and of, of the uh, connections at the level of an Appendix B uh, top, uh, top level safety uh, system. So uh, how do we make sure that our inspectors understand those distinctions as they're looking at, at how these uh, procedures are maintained, how the training is done, how the equipment is stored, uh, and so forth. Uh, and, and that really has been built into the process uh, from the beginning to, to start bringing our people up to speed. At headquarters, uh, they, they were engaged very early in the process, in the development of the guidance, and then in the licensing approval of, of the licensee strategies. Um, and as, as they went through that process, there were several steps in the process. Uh, first, the licensee provided a plan uh, for how they were going to implement a strategy. And it didn't have a lot of the design details of how that was going to be implemented, but it described uh, where connections were going to be, what types of equipment would be, what the capacity of that equipment would be, how it would be stored. Uh, and the staff produced, in headquarters, produced what we called an interim staff evaluation uh, that, that bought into the plan. And as part of that review, there was an on-site audit that was conducted by headquarters licensing people, uh, and the regions sent people to accompany those. And that was kind of the first step to start bringing regional people into an awareness of what was going on uh, in, in these, uh, implementing these strategies. Uh, 
in parallel with the reviews that were ongoing, we developed the temporary instruction that will guide the inspectors on the, on the full implementation inspections. Uh, the regions were involved in, in the development of that uh, temporary instruction. And the first unit to achieve compliance was actually the new unit, Watts Bar Unit 2, was required to achieve compliance prior to fuel load. Uh, so they were the first one that got the inspection uh, under the temporary instruction. And inspectors from all of the regions came and uh, went to Watts Bar and, and uh, observed and participated in that activity so that they could see it being implemented and get a common frame of reference for, for uh, the further implementation of the TI in each of the regions. So now that uh, licensees are completing implementation, uh, the, the, when, when they come out of that outage and they've completed their implementation, they provide a, a letter to, to headquarters uh, certifying that they have completed implementation of the order. At that point, the staff in headquarters, the licensing staff, completes the safety evaluation that establishes the licensing basis for the, the flex strategy and, and the spent fuel pool instrumentation going forward. And that safety evaluation will be uh, a tool that will guide the inspectors. Uh, so, so when we talk about the difference between design basis and beyond design basis, that, that is a tool that will guide the inspectors in, in what is the accepted licensing basis for each facility. Because given the uniquenesses of the facilities, each, each of them has a fairly unique approach to the strategy. Uh, and, and so uh, to ensure that there's a shared understanding of, of that safety evaluation and how it's applied in the temporary instruction, uh, a member of the license review team will accompany the regional inspectors in implementing the temporary instruction uh, so that we ensure that alignment remains uh, for that site relative to its licensing basis. And then finally, we'll be having a, a management review panel. Uh, I think it's being called the inspection findings review panel. Uh, any finding from any of the inspections at any site is going to come to this review panel, which will consist of managers from NRR who've been involved in the, the development of the guidance and, and the uh, licensing process, as well as uh, management uh, representatives from each of the four regions. So all of us will be together looking at the findings and ensuring that we are applying uh, the guidance and, and the requirements consistently across all the regions. Thanks. Okay. Eddie? I mentioned earlier that one of the strengths about our nuclear energy industry, or one of the great things about it, is that we readily share with each other and uh, we readily help each other out. And in that spirit, we have a number of avenues where we share the lessons learned with each other and making sure that we are learning and continuing to improve um, every moment of every day. And so a uh, couple of the avenues we have is that through the uh, coordination through uh, Nuclear Energy Institute, we have a weekly conference call with uh, the uh, Fukushima project implementation leads, and we share the lessons learned, not just inspection uh, lessons learned, but also other lessons learned from an implementation standpoint, and we make sure that that's, uh, that continues um, uh, every, every week and make sure that we're, we're learning from it. Um, also, from a, from a senior leadership uh, of, of the industry, we have a number of uh, forums where we share lessons learned with each other. Um, as a matter of fact, on Monday we had the uh, ANSIAC meeting. Um, that's the Nuclear Strategic Issues Advisory Committee meeting. It's uh, chief nuclear officers as well as uh, senior leaders from NEI and INPO, and making sure that we share with each other in terms of the lessons learned and, and continue to get better. Uh, also, uh, we're looking at the NEI webpage and making sure we expand that webpage and, and add those lessons learned so it's readily available for everyone. And, um, and then uh, the, most, the most important um, avenue we share lessons learned is that we pick up the phone and call each other and talk to each other and make sure that we're helping each other get better. Okay, thank you very much. I want to uh, go to a question that we got uh, that I'm going to ask Mark to answer. It really is a question, I think, directed at the NRC staff. And it's regarding safety culture. And the question is, the safety culture policy applies to the nuclear industry. How does the NRC apply safety culture policy and its in, uh, to its regulatory inspection and licensing activities? And so, Mark, would you start that answer? And then if others want to weigh in, um, feel free to. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um... I would offer uh, that uh, while the safety culture and uh, 
policy statement does not apply to the NRC per se. We are very focused as an organization on safety culture. We have, I think it's every three years, the Office of the Inspector General uh, conducted safety culture and climate survey, and that looks at a number of attributes with respect to uh, how do we conduct business internal to the NRC, how do we engage with external stakeholders, including members of the public, and how do we interact uh, with those entities that we regulate. Uh, one of the key aspects of uh, safety, a healthy safety culture is the staff's confidence that they can raise an issue or express a differing view and not be subject to any adverse action or repercussions as a result of that. And I know that we, as a management team, strive very uh, uh, strongly to ensure that staff have a comfort level uh, regarding uh, raising uh, issues. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I try and profess in Region 4 is uh, when it comes to decision making, we want the views of everyone to be considered and then clear feedback provided on uh, the basis for the decision and how individuals' uh, particular input was considered in arriving at a decision. Uh, you know, with respect to uh, how we interact with licensees and members of the public, uh, you know, we, we want to abide by our values, integrity, service, openness, uh, commitment, cooperation, excellence, and respect. And respect is, uh, you know, relates to how do you interact, how do you communicate. Uh, we hold ourselves accountable to those values. Uh, we are very focused on, you know, the aspect that behavior matters. Uh, and, and, you know, we approach our regulatory responsibilities with a trust but verify. Well, how you go about engaging in that verification process, you know, are you clearly communicating issues to uh, licensees so there is a shared understanding of uh, what the particular inspector has determined is the regulatory or safety uh, significance. Uh, and we do have a, what we call objectivity reviews where we have uh, first-line supervisors will observe inspectors in the field uh, and will evaluate you know, how they go about implementing the inspection process. Uh, and there are procedures that govern the inspection process as there are procedures that govern uh, licensing reviews. Uh, so those are just some thoughts that I would offer. Thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? No? No takers? Okay. Very good. Well, Mark was very thorough, as he always is. Um, so I want to uh, switch gears and uh, re-tee up the topic of Project AIM, uh, again, recognizing that we've had a lot of discussion on uh, this topic, uh, certainly in this RIC. Um, so the agency is embarking on or has embarked on an initiative that is Project AIM. We're well underway with respect to that initiative, as you've uh, heard in other sessions. Um, of course, the nuclear industry is facing uh, similar challenges and is bar in a, uh, has embarked on um, a, a very uh, sort of an analogous um, sort of activity delivering the nuclear promise. And so the question that I have relates to um, first Kathy and then Tim. What's your perspective, Kathy, about Project AIM? Uh, and how will the project ensure that we successfully overcome challenges, expected organizational challenges, fiscal challenges, uh, resulting from changes in the regulatory environment. And um, how will we do that while continuing to maintain our focus on safety uh, and security? And then for Tim, uh, regarding delivering the Nuclear Promise Initiative and its objectives, how will the industry uh, ensure that the objectives or the promise are met in a manner that doesn't diminish safety and security. So, um, but again, very parallel questions on parallel initiatives. Kathy, first. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, I do welcome the opportunity to discuss Project AIM from the regional perspective. I think in uh, many of the commissioners and the chairman's opening remarks, um, they touched on Project AIM as well as there was a session yesterday on Project AIM uh, where you um, heard about uh, the um, goals of the project from uh, the agency level. But uh, as you would assume, um, the goals at the regional level um, parallel and, and actually are fully supportive of that. Um, what, um, if you recall back to what we've been hearing, is there have been the rebaselining efforts. And while most of that work has been done out of um, headquarters, all the regions have been very heavily involved in any of the decision making uh, at the staff level that's been made and, uh, and in the prioritizing of the work that has been done. Uh, Chris Kennedy, Mark's uh, deputy regional administrator, 
uh, supported um, the regions on that meeting and the, the effort of reprioritizing and forming some of the elements and the, the material that went into the commission paper uh, that recently went that contained uh, staff's recommendations with regards to the rebasing effort. Uh, if you look through that list, a lot of them have to, the actions have to do with rulemaking activities, administrative support issues, travel, training. Um, but you do see um, examples in there that pertain directly to the work that uh, the four of us are, are overseeing. Some of the examples that you see are the stopping mid-cycle reviews. That's one of the items that's in the near term, the six month. Uh, another one is a recommendation in reducing uh, uh, resources in the construction area, uh, which that one pertains specifically to my region. Also looking at efficiencies in the fuel cycle. I, I bring up these other business lines just to say the, uh, uh, the reductions in the rebaselining efforts go across all of our business lines. Um, then we touch on efficiencies in streamlining the significance determination process, as Cindy mentioned, and again, another plug for tomorrow's session. And then um, another one to, to mention, again, this, these last two are in the more near, uh, the longer term, the 18-month period, efficiencies in the reactor inspection report documentation. Uh, as we've looked at, at the proposed reductions, really we're looking at, um, from our standpoint at the region, are we able to continue to carry out our safety and security mission? And the answer is yes, we think we are able to do that with um, minimal adverse impact. Now that's not to say that there won't be changes uh, in the, the regions and how we go through um, our day-to-day -day operations, but from the standpoint of, of meeting our mission of safety and security, uh, we're very confident that, that we'll be able to do that. Uh, one of the, the quotes I think that I would take away from, from yesterday's session, and uh, I think it might have been Maria that had said it, but it applies to us uh, as well as everyone, um, the NRC as well as uh, all the industry and other representatives in the room. I think the key for us is really having the right person in the right place at the right time. And this goes directly to making sure that we're identifying the critical skill set that we need uh, to perform the areas um, and well, I may in Region 2 have that critical skill set if uh, Cindy needs it in Region 3, that we can share resources across the different lines, and that's how I think we'll meet the, the, the future. We're doing that in several areas already as we're sharing inspectors between different regions, license examiners be between different regions. But that's one of the keys that, um, one of the tools that we'll use as we move forward uh, in carrying out, making sure that we're meeting our, our missions. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, for delivering the nuclear promise, um, our, our objectives are to um, continue to build this on the safety and the reliability piece. We think that uh, we've done that well over the, over the last decade in terms of continually improving our reliability and safety at the stations. However, what we've kind of left uh, untouched or, or haven't focused on as much is driving the efficiency into the way we do that and therefore uh, controlling our cost. Uh, and our costs have escalated overall about 28 percent uh, over that same decade. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's to the point now where economically uh, many of the stations uh, without action will, will uh, become very challenged uh, in de depending on what market they're in and their, their uh, viability to remain economically viable to continue to do, to do that, to, 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 to operate. So uh, the focus is in every case balanced with ensuring that we're not going to reduce safety or reliability uh, through the initiatives. Uh, that, that's viewed uh, at the steering committee. We have 35 initiatives that we intend to roll out in 2016, 2017, and each one of those is reviewed by the steering committee, which is 10 CNOs, uh, an executive from NEI, an executive from IMPO, and uh, to make sure that the the approach that we're taking is not going to, to uh, reduce safety or reliability. Uh, there, there's, there's then a webinar uh, that would be used for each of these to inform everyone on how to implement it uh, by maintaining that, that focus on safety and reliability. Uh, we have assessments at the stations that will be done, uh, assessments across the fleets for those stations that are in fleets, and then we have IMPO uh, who is uh, traveling with us during this whole journey and they're making, an adjust, they're making adjustments to ensure uh, that we're not uh, limiting our, our look or our scope in terms of our pursuit of excellence. So uh, as they come in and they do their evaluations, their assist visits, 
uh, as they trend information for any individual station or the industry as a whole, uh, there will be um, thresholds that will, will uh, introduce uh, additional challenge to make sure that uh, we're addressing any early signs of, of decline uh, or adverse uh, results that we were not expecting. So uh, we've built quite a bit of check and balance into the process um, and we'll be rolling each one of those out with using a consistent methodology of the, the training webinar, if you will. Uh, they'll all come out in a bulletin <coughs> form uh, with uh, very specific guidance on how to implement. Some of them obviously are easier than others. Uh, we have rolled out four of such bulletins. We approved six more earlier this week and those will be released in the next few days. So uh, we'll have 10 bulletins on the street here uh, within a couple of days that uh, will begin our delivering of the nuclear promise. So we've got uh, a pretty significant goal of reducing uh, all-in costs by 30 percent uh, across the industry. Uh, we've made good progress on that in the last several years and I think we've got a, a, a very uh, intriguing set of 35 initiatives that are going to help us get uh, a good portion of that 30 percent over the next two and a half years. Great. Thank you, Tim. I have a couple of questions that are related, um, so I'll, I'm going to tee those up. I think they are directed at the NRC, so um, so you guys will get a chance to decide who you want to weigh in on this. Um, they both relate to consistency across the regions. So one question is, how are the NRC's efforts to provide consistency in the process of addressing low-level findings being effective? I'm sorry, how are the NRC's efforts to provide consistency in the process of addressing low-level findings um, being effective, or how effective are they, I guess I would say, and, and what, what have been the results to date? And then the, the second question, very related topic, or same topic, what are you doing as regional administrators to address the significant differences between regions on the number of green findings or violations as noted in a recent GAO audit report? And what are you doing to uh, approve the consistency of inspection and decision making between the regions? How can headquarters staff help you with this? So um, who wants to take that? <laughs> Nobody. Um, this, this is Dan Dorman. Uh, the, the, uh, the issue arises from uh, a GAO study actually a couple of years ago that, that found, uh, st I would say, statistically significant differences between uh, the regions on the numbers of uh, low significance findings. Uh, they, for, for the greater than green findings, they did not find an inconsistency. Um, a year or so ago, there was an effort that, uh, that uh, was led by NRR, uh, Division of Inspection uh, and Regional Support, to understand what those differences were. Uh, they developed some, some uh, I would say, a, a tabletop scenarios. Uh, they, they described uh, performance deficiencies that might be discovered in an inspection and the circumstances surrounding that and brought in, uh, in experienced inspectors from all of the regions uh, and had them independently develop the finding associated with those scenarios. And, and I think the area that that focused us on the most greatly was the minor more than minor distinction. Um, so the action out of that is to develop uh, into the manual chapter additional guidance uh, and, and examples uh, to help inspectors and, and their management in the regions to be more consistent in applying those standards. I think we're, we're still early in that process. We, it's too early to say how effective that is, um, but, but that is the steps that we're taking on that. And just uh, one thing to add, uh, another factor in why there have been differences in the number of green findings gets to uh, credit for identification. You know, when is it self-revealing? When is it licensee identified? Uh, uh, when is it NRC identified? And, you know, we're looking at... Uh, if you identify an issue as uh, part of a surveillance test, uh, should you get credit for that in terms of uh, licensee identified, or what if uh, uh, the deficiency that was manifested during the surveillance test was not part of uh, the planned surveillance scope? So there's been quite a bit of discussion between the regional offices and the program office, uh, the Division of Inspection and Regional Support uh, that is uh, led by Scott Morris, 
uh, on how to uh, resolve the, some of the differences in uh, credit for identification. And then the specific question, you know, how um, are we as respective regional administrators engaging to ensure consistency? I, I can speak to uh, my involvement in uh, processes in Region 4. Uh, we have inspection debriefs. Every uh, a resident uh, report, quarterly inspection report, is uh, debriefed uh, with uh, DRP and uh, appropriate DRS management in attendance. Uh, and uh, the uh, senior resident uh, and resident inspector explain the findings that have been identified and the basis for determining why they were more than minor. Uh, they, we have the Division of Reactor Safety has inspection uh, debriefs. I, I've attended uh, those debriefs, and uh, uh, there have been times where uh, we have decided that the finding uh, was not appropriately characterized, and there were some changes made. But I would offer, uh, uh, by and large, uh, with few exceptions, uh, uh, it's been my experience that uh, the more than minor determinations uh, have been appropriate. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, that's one, one uh, thing that we're doing. And then the, the other thing is uh, when I listen to the uh, mid-cycle and end-of-cycle discussions, uh, there's a very extensive collaborative discussion there to ensure the characterization of licensee uh, performance is appropriate. And another thing I would offer is that we did relatively recently revise the uh, criteria for determining a cross-cutting issue there, and they're deterministic backstops. Uh, but I think one of the industry concerns was if you have more green findings, you have more findings with a uh, cross-cutting aspect there, and you potentially cross the threshold for substantive cross-cutting issue, that criteria has uh, changed. Uh, uh, and as you know, it uh, takes, I think, six findings in the, with the same cross-cutting theme. And then in human performance, as an example, a deterministic backstop is uh, 20 findings. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, for me, uh, the most significant uh, outcome of that GAO report was consistency across the regions regarding greater than green findings, and I, I hope that we don't lose focus on that because that, that to me, is uh, really uh, the most important aspect there in terms of consistency across the regions uh, because that results in, obviously, resource expenditure by the industry to address those. Maybe just to add a, a little bit more, <clears throat> this is Cindy. Uh, We've been trying to do a better job of pre-planning uh, our inspection activity from the perspective of when we enter into new areas. For example, as Dan mentioned, the post-Fukushima temporary instruction we'll be doing, we're creating into the process a cross-regional, with NRR support, um, process to screen all of those issues such that we have and develop a more common understanding of the more than minor minor threshold. So I think we're trying to uh, project a little bit better when we're going to need these uh, types of integrations, if you will. And I think that is going to serve us well and has served us well in the number of areas we've done it in the past. Um, another thing, we have opportunities where we do uh, benchmarking cross shared resources across. We've done some more of that. And we've also um, encouraged and have ongoing counterpart conversations at various levels through the organization. And they're very focused on this as well. And so I think we're trying to do a few more things proactively to get ahead of it and build it into our process um, instead of waiting to see if the outcomes are different. And then, Mike, if I could comment, this is Kathy. For um, those of you in the audience from Region 2 are aware that I've only been in this position about six weeks. Um, so um, this is a great opportunity for, for me to engage in, in this area. Um, more of an anecdotal story um, than um, a specific example, as uh, Cindy and Dan and Mark have given. Uh, when I was um, assuming the position in uh, Region 2, uh, one of the things that was very early in the process brought to my attention was this GAO report. And, and um, I've been able to, with fresh eyes, be able to come into the region as well as into the program areas. And really, uh, one of the areas that I am focusing on is, is this, and I think um, the, it's a testament to the fact that this is very key on all of our minds and that we are working together and just the synergy that's created amongst the different regional administrators and, and bringing, drawing the attention to this very important matter. Okay, very good. I have a couple of questions that are follow-up to our, I think, earlier discussion on significance determination process. And um, one is for the industry. So I don't know, Tim, if you wanted to start with this one. Or, Fatty, you guys decide. Um, as the NRC makes efforts to streamline the enforcement process, uh, SDP specifically, to improve the timeliness of find, finding disposition and reduce resources, licensees, and NRCs, 
um, used to finalize significance determinations, will the industry be willing to reset the inclination to re reanalyze and to challenge final determinations? So will the industry be willing to reset the inclination to reanalyze re and challenge final determinations is a question. Tim. Fatty, that sounds like a good one. For you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, part of the changes uh, that we will make is that as an industry, we'll have to be and we'll need to be and we are willing to be uh, more timely and responsive in doing our evaluations and making sure that we bring it to closure the right way. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we are interested in, in focusing our efforts on, on safety and reliability and risk, and, and uh, want to make sure that we're doing the right evaluations and the uh, right um, uh, uh, reviews in a timely way to bring that to closure so we stay focused on safety and reliability and risk. Ian, I would just add that um, I think in the process as we look at the process and enhancements or revisions, um, we would entertain, you know, that, that opportunity to, uh, to do less of that or not do that any longer if, if that's the case. But the process has to, you know, be built to support that kind of outcome. So um, we'll, we'll be uh, very interested in being engaged in that review process and providing that input when, when that comes around. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Tim. Also uh, related to the significance determination process, this one for you, Kathy, uh, as a follow-up. Has the NRC considered using this, some of the, the same uh, new SDP process enhancements that are being considered for the reactor oversight process in the construction reactor oversight process? For example, the inspection review board, uh, the early senior manager interaction, so on and so forth. Thanks, Mike. Very good question. Um, in Region uh, 2, we really have the, the opportunity to benchmark the operating against the construction, the construction against the operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so um, while we're working routinely with NRR on the operating side, we're working routinely with um, the Office of uh, New Reactors uh, also on a daily basis. So we're well aware of the activities that are going on, on uh, with regards to the operating reactors, and we are considering that with regards to the, the new plants and how we can bring best practices uh, from both sides. And um, we want to pride ourselves in being a learning organization as even beyond just um, uh, the reactor oversight program, if there are things that we can um, bring from one side to the other and vice versa, we do that. Um, also, we really take it so far as even um, in Region 2, unique from the other regions, we have the fuel facilities. Um, again, there are lessons learned operating experience that we bring uh, between all three different uh, business lines, large business lines that we have in Region 2. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of questions related to decommissioning, and uh, so there I think, uh, and they're directed at Dan, so I'm going to tee them up, and Dan, you can take them in uh, any order. Uh, the first is, um, Region 1 has experience with decommissioning of public utility-owned plants. What is your perspective on the decommissioning of merchant plants and their inability uh, to rely on ratepayers for decommissioning costs, I guess is the question. And the second question is, is there any thought around restructuring or changing Region 1 organization uh, and for approaches based on large numbers of plants in Region 1 uh, going into decommissioning? Okay, so, so uh, Kathy gets to build them. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, deregulated markets in the Northeast, as you, as you all know, are very challenging for uh, the merchant nuclear power plants, and we have uh, had the permanent closure of Vermont Yankee at the end of 2014. Uh, we have announced uh, intentions for permanent closures for Fitzpatrick uh, in January of next year, uh, for Pilgrim uh, no later than mid-2019, and for Oyster Creek by the end of 2019. So uh, to, the, to the question of thoughts around restructuring or changing Region 1, Clearly, we know that, that uh, as those plants transition from operating status to, to a permanent shutdown and decommissioning, uh, we will be getting smaller. Uh, the, the, the next one uh, that will impact us is the closure of Fitzpatrick, uh, and so that, is, uh, that impact will come next year. 
Uh, and so that is in our, our uh, thoughts in terms of uh, how that will impact our organizational structure. I think it, at this point it, it means we'll get a little smaller and how we do that specifically within the organization uh, is, is still under discussion. Um, the, the other question had to do with the distinction between a, a publicly regulated utility and, and the presumption there is that even in a decommissioning status that utility could go to their public utilities commission and, and uh, get approval for some fee to be passed through to a ratepayer if there was some shortfall in the decommissioning trust fund uh, versus Vermont Yankee. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of interest from the community and from the state uh, around whether the trust fund is adequate. Uh, the decommissioning trust fund for Vermont Yankee is upwards of $600 million. The estimated cost of decommissioning the facility is upwards of $1 billion. Uh, there was, you, if you uh, heard Commissioner Barron this morning talking about the decommissioning uh, rulemaking, this is an area of great interest in the decommissioning rulemaking is, is uh, the decommissioning trust funds and, and what's the role that the state and local communities can play in, in, uh, in helping in the decision making process in, in the decommissioning. Where we are right now is uh, when, when a plant enters decommissioning status, the frequency of updates to the NRC on the decommissioning trust fund status uh, is the frequency is increased to every year. Uh, there is a, a small cadre of financial experts in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation uh, that examine those, the balances and the, uh, the investments uh, of, of those funds which are managed by, uh, by uh, independent uh, trustees uh, and examine those from the standpoint of the licensees decommissioning strategy and decommissioning cost estimates uh, to assess whether there is reasonable assurance that those funds uh, will be invested and will grow in a manner that will support that uh, decommissioning plan. In the case of Vermont Yankee, uh, they have indicated a plan to use the safe store option that exists under the current regulation. Uh, that allows them to wait as much as 50 years uh, before beginning the de dismantling and decommissioning. Um, I, I think the projection uh, based on the existing trust fund and the projected growth of the trust fund is that they will begin that work in, in the 30 to 40 year time frame uh, and by rule they have up to 60 years to complete that work. Uh, so. so Based on our review of their trust fund, their investment, uh, and the projections of the growth of that fund and the cost of the decommissioning uh, activities, uh, the staff has reasonable assurance that that fund will support the decommissioning of that plant. Um, we'll have similar reviews, I'm sure, as we go forward with the other merchant plants as, as they enter into decommissioning. Uh, and we will continue with the decommissioning rulemaking and take that wherever the commission takes us. All right, very good. Thank you, Dan. Um, Tim, this question is for you, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, you'll be able to answer very quickly. Actually, I should point out that Tim's first name is not really spelt with two M's. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can blame us for that. Um, but this question is to Tim, and it is, are these 35 initiatives, talking about delivering the nuclear promise, are the 35 initiatives you talked about publicly available? And let me just broaden the question. How much of delivering the nuclear promise is publicly available? If a member of the public wanted to go find it, uh, what, what would they find? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, I know that we do have some um, communication materials that have been developed for the public. Um, and uh, we, we sum in those materials, we summarize some of the uh, initiatives that, or the types of initiatives that we're pursuing. Uh, the 35 initiatives are on uh, the NEI website, but currently that's for members only. So um, NEI has a communication plan, uh, we'll, and we'll take that feedback back to NEI and and uh, and uh, try to try to determine how much of it we should be putting out there. For for the public to view, but there is a, uh, a docket or a document that's been created for, for public use and public communication of the initiative in itself. It doesn't get down into the detail of the 35 uh, specific opportunities. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. This next question relates to, uh, well, I think should be answered, we're, we're gonna try to answer it by the NRC, uh, but also uh, by the industry. It uh, relates to new reg 1022 Rev 3. And the question is, 
That new reg included a discussion that SSCs not meeting the tech spec LCO uh, is considered not capable of performing its safety function. This caused licensees to submit hundreds of 5072 and 5073 reports that add little value, uh, for example, secondary containment LCOs. What's the NRC doing to reduce this licensee burden? And I guess I wanted uh, to also uh, an industry perspective, if, you've, uh, if you have one on this issue. That's a good one for them. Uh, <laughs> do you want me to start first? OK. Um, I was just going to add a couple of thoughts. Well, I'm no expert on the new regs, so I'll tell you that up front. <laughs> um, but I, I think just from a general perspective, if there are items that you think are of, of little value or low value, those should be things that are brought to the table. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, NRR has routine periodic meetings on the ROP. That would be an example. If it's something very specific to a particular licensee, maybe you need to look, do you need a tech spec change or something that would alleviate the, the problem. Uh, but obviously, you're accountable to your existing rules and regulations. If you think there's something there that's not of value, we've got various processes in which to pursue that. I'm not aware of any widespread um, examination we're doing to try to reduce 5072s or 5073 reporting. Yeah, at the industry, for the industry, we're working through NEI um, really on a, a process enhancement around operability determinations. Um, so we're, we've got that drafted. Uh, we we uh, will be seeking NRC input on that document. Um, it will be out in the second quarter for industry to review and comment on. Uh, and, and engage NRC on, and our goal is to have a, a, a draft that's in real good shape by the third quarter of this year. Uh, and so that would help us uh, ultimately um, treat these kind of issues with uh, more um, efficiency, more consistency, repeatability, uh, and hopefully it eliminates a lot of the unnecessary reporting and so forth. So NEI has got the, uh, the lead on that through the, through the licensees. I'll offer just one quick perspective. Uh, I think uh, some of these examples may very well fall into that arena that I was speaking to uh, regarding low risk, low safety, mm -hmm. significant compliance issues. And I mentioned the workshop uh, where the industry and the NRC would be asked collectively to identify examples and helping to define that threshold. And perhaps some of these examples you're referencing the question, the individual that offered the question regarding 5072, 5073 reports, I assume there are operability decisions associated with those, and perhaps those could be included in that workshop uh, discussion and dialogue. If, if I could just add one thing, there was a mention in the question, I think, of secondary containment, and one of the particular issues that arose out of that revision of New Reg 1022 uh, was uh, situations where uh, by uh, human error for a matter of seconds, the inner door and the outer door of the airlock are opened at the same time. Uh, and that one did produce a, a large number of, of reports to the NRC under 5072, 5073. Um, the NRR took a look at the wording in 1022 relative to that and concluded that 1022 was, was adequate, but that some plants had very... Uh, restrictive tech specs that resulted in those reports. And so there has been uh, an initiative to have a standard tech spec revision that would support that. There are some plants I know in Region 1 that have, that have gotten the change. I think there are some that are still under review. So, so that, that adjustment, uh, it, that's where the adjustment is being made on that specific issue. Dan, just uh, the last we heard that TISTIF was due out around June of this year. Is that still the timeline? I'm looking around the NRR. The I'm getting I'm getting shoulder shrugs from the NRR, but we'll get we'll get back to you on that. But I think that my my recollection is at least one of my plants has already gotten the amendment. So, uh, but we'll we can get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. No lifeline takers. No. <laughs> okay, no lifeline. Right. Okay. Um, uh, this question or these questions actually follow up on the operability discussion that we had, uh, Mark and Fatty. So I'll direct them to you. Um, they actually touch on the same, the same issue. Regarding the low probability compliance issues impacting operability, uh, the process sounds like, or the process that we described, uh, sounds like a long-term NOED, which goes against the NOED intent. Similarly, it sounds like an intrusion of probability into the op eval process. 
How do you reconcile this new process with previous agency and industry guidance and expectations? And then, so the related question, the very same question maybe is, um, Mr. DePaulty referred to a longer duration enforcement discretion for, lo for low risk items. How does the agency envision implementing this? For example, revise the NOED process, new process, et cetera. Well, I'll offer a, an initial thought, and then uh, I think Rob Elliott's here in the audience there. I, I may use him as a lifeline here since he is the individual in DERS that has specific uh, ownership for uh, this initiative. Uh, but uh, the intent here is not to bring probability into play regarding the deterministic uh, uh, operability determination. Uh, well, thanks. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you cannot bring probability into uh, that equation. You, licensees would have to determine uh, the compensatory measures they can take. Is the uh, uh, particular structure system or component operable? Can it perform its intended uh, safety function? Uh, what we're talking about is NRC inspectors not focusing a lot of attention on that operability determination uh, that is made by the licensee, but looking at if we both agree that it is of low safety significance here, what is the time frame for correction? You know, uh, is there discretion such that that condition can continue to exist for some period of time based on the uh, safety significance as determined by bringing a probabilistic risk assessment uh, to the equation? But it is not intended to, uh, if you will, restructure the operability determination process to allow probability to come into play because, uh, you know, the assumption there is that the event occurs and then you have to look at can that structure system or component provider the appropriate mitigative function. So uh, I hope I, I apologize if I left you with the uh, uh, impression that we are looking at bringing probability into that OD process. That's not the case. Um, I'm going to ask Rob if there's anything he wants to add to that. Bet you didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> yes, I did give him a heads up. I may use him as a lifeline. Um, so, yeah, what Mark said is true. We're not introducing operability into the, uh, into the operability determination process. Uh, the concept of whether or not we're looking at NOEDs differently, that's a potential solution path. The devil's in the details about how we work this process out, but one of the ways that we're looking at it, we might implement it, is to utilize a, a different version of the NOED process, and that would probably require notifying the commission that we're changing the way we originally told them that we would do NOEDs. And from, a, from an industry perspective, we're, we're still uh, developing this uh, guidance document, and uh, we, we appreciate your feedback, and we'll make sure we're clear in the document on what, on, in terms of what it is and what it's not. And so appreciate the feedback on that. I just offer the overarching goal here is not to continue to expend uh, agency resources and the industry expend resources on addressing issues that are a very low probability, uh, low safety significance here. Um, and uh, so can we carve out a process there, which is allowed when you look at the language that I uh, referenced in the enforcement policy, for us to disposition issues that are of low risk significance, and that can include exercising enforcement discretion to achieve an outcome that in our view is not putting public health and safety at risk. Okay, uh, a question related to project aim or actually more directly related to delivering the nuclear promise. I think it's directed at, uh, at the regional administrators actually. Um, economics and nuclear power, uh, economics around nuclear power generation are driving individuals, and, individual and industry wide changes. How are the regions ensuring that initiatives like nuclear promise are not compromising safety? So how are you ensuring that those changes I can, I can start. I imagine multiples of us probably want to add into this. Um, it's certainly an area that is of significant interest to us because uh, there are the potentials for performance to be impacted and areas of performance that we regulate. So certainly it's something that's of interest to us. I know in, in Region 3 specifically, we included a discussion about delivering the nuclear promise as part of our end of cycle internal meetings to make sure our staff was uh, familiar and 
We will likely have another briefing on that uh, in an upcoming seminar. But we're making our staff sensitive to the issue and sensitive to uh, looking for could there be negative performance uh, changes with that. Also, we've started a dialogue among some of us uh, just recently about whether we need to do things uh, more broadly in looking at this and the potential for performance so we don't get into see previous question on regional consistency. Um, so we're, we're looking at ways that we want to be thinking about this, but certainly we do have interest in the area um, because it does have the potential to change performance. I guess I would just add that our baseline inspection program is focused on safety outcomes, not on uh, dollar figures investments to the plants. So, so that doesn't change. Uh, so our focus is still on the outcomes. Um, I would say a, a related uh, but slightly different issue that we have in Region 1 with the announced closures uh, is we have plants that uh, are going to potentially operate several cycles where they have announced a closure and that, that's changing how they're looking at the future of the plant potentially uh, and, and the types of investments and, and the frequency of the investments that they're making in the plant. And again, our, our focus within the, the baseline inspection is to target our samples to, in, in that direction of, of operations and maintenance and are they doing the things to ensure that the licensing basis, design basis of the plant continues to be met right up until the last day uh, and, and ensure the safe operation of the plant right up until permanent closure. We have flexibilities in our sample selections within the baseline program and we uh, experienced that with Vermont Yankee as they got up to their closure at the end of 14. Uh, and, and we are doing similar things with, with the other plants that have announced closures. But again, our focus is on the safety outcomes, not where the dollars are spent. Tim Wyatt, previously when we were talking about uh, delivering the nuclear promise, I had mentioned a document. So this is the document you can find on the NEI website uh, available to the public. And it was published in February. So it's an up-to-date document on uh, what we've shared publicly so far on delivering the nuclear promise. And from a safety perspective, you know, it's, it's our top priority. And uh, through delivering nuclear promise, our goal is to advance safety and reliability while uh, gaining efficiencies. And um, as, a, as an industry, we'll put a lot of checks and balances in place to make sure we stay focused on safety. And so uh, that's, that's uh, our responsibility, and we take that very seriously. I just add one additional uh, comment. Uh, I don't see... Uh, some of the uh, uh, delivering the nuclear promise uh, initiatives uh, being in conflict with our uh, regulatory role. Like an example of that is, as I understand it, uh, I think you have involvement with this, Tim, the design change control process, looking for one standardized process that can be used across the industry. When we conduct our inspection activities, we're still going to look at has there been appropriate training? Has the 50-59 process been followed? What is, Dan said, what are the outcomes there, independent of what is the process that is being used there? So I don't see those at cross purposes. I would expect the process that the industry comes up with to address the same elements uh, that are associated with uh, you know, our design control uh, regulatory requirements would be encompassed in that process that would be used. And where we identified instances where the implementation of that uh, uh, common procedure, if you will, for the design change process isn't implemented adequately, we would write an appropriate violation and uh, safety significance would be what it is based on the circumstances. So I don't see those being a, a disconnected or across purposes per se. I, I agree. And just to add on that, it actually, if, go, if industry goes to a standardized process in the area such as engineering design, it actually could make us more efficient mm -hmm. because our inspectors don't have to go and learn 65 different um, engineering change processes. So I agree the, the, the goals are not in conflict. There are potentials in some areas to actually be complementary. But the reiteration of the bottom line is we're still going to be looking at the safety performance and you know that'll be uh, not where your dollars go as has been said but how the performance is. Yeah and just to stay with that theme from back to the standard design process when it's implemented, then we're sharing lessons learned across the whole industry to further improve the safety, the reliability, as well as the efficiency. Right. So uh, where I have my own program now, I can share with others that have similar design programs. We will all have exactly the same design program, so the lessons learned will come out, you know, a uh, hundred stations at a time. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be learning uh, 
more efficiently across the entire industry. Anyone else? Thank you. Very good. All right, so this question is for Kathy. Um, regarding, I think, AIM 2020, or actually how we move forward, I think, in the area of construction, our 1245, Inspection Manual Chapter 1245 and Inspection Manual Chapter 1252 being combined into one program. And I think that really points to a question, of maybe a, a, a more general question about how do we, how, how do you see construction and operations moving forward as units move from construction to operations? Well, thanks, Mike. That is one of the things that we're um, discussing on a daily basis. So from a standpoint, I'm going to address it two ways, Mike. One is the qualification, uh, and this does relate to um, project AIM, and this is the agility and the fungibility of our inspectors to cross lines between the different, uh, between operating reactors and new reactors and new reactors and operating reactors. And it gets at my comment earlier about making sure that we have uh, the individuals with the right critical skills where we need them and being able to leverage different um, different divisions, different programs within the region as well as between the regions. So we will be looking forward at, as from a qualification standpoint of our inspectors, how can we best accomplish that and then making sure that our manual chapters follow that. Um, taking it to the even broader step is the aspect of that transition between when does a reactor under construction move into a reactor uh, an operating reactor. And we're seeing that now with Watts Bar in that transition. Um, we've, um, from a structural standpoint within the region, uh, we had a branch that was set up to focus on um, the construction as we're moving back into operations with Unit 2 at Watts Bar. Uh, that will go back into the normal uh, line management and um, will uh, make us a, a very small organizational change as a result of that. Um, in with regards to uh, Vogel and Summer, the same thing will be applied there as, as they move forward and get closer to operating. Uh, we're looking at what's the best way on an interim basis to have the region organized um, to handle it. Do we need, for instance, do we need two sides to the region, one focused on operating plants, one focused on uh, construction plants, and asking ourselves when is the right question to merge um, uh, those areas, and that's something that, that frequently, I would say, at least at my level, comes up on a weekly basis, and I'm sure in some of my staff's discussions and conversations it comes up more frequently. Now, with regards to that, those conversations really we're also having uh, with NRR and NRO because we want to sync any uh, regional uh, movement with regards to organizational structure and who's talking to who, also with how that's handling between uh, the two headquarters offices. So again, there's a plan there, there's discussions going on there, and we'll, we'll continue. And I think as we um, move forward uh, over time with the construction of the plants, those uh, questions and uh, firmer and, and more concrete plans will become even more um, in the forefront of our mind, and rather than be thinking about it on a weekly basis, it will be on a, on a daily basis also. Okay, thank you very much. So there's a, there's a, there's a question that I'll ask that uh, I just want a fairly um, crisp response to uh, from the RAs. Many of the questions asked are being discussed in detail at RUG meetings with your, at RUG meetings. Um, with your support of RUGs, do you think all RAs should support the RUG by attending? If other RAs disagree, um, please have them explain. So I wanted to just get the rug issue support RA question out for you guys to respond to. Um, I happen to think uh, regional administrator attendance at the rug meetings is uh, very important, and I have strived to attend every rug meeting that has uh, occurred while I've been the regional administrator in Region 4. And if I'm not able to attend due to a conflict that I can't, uh, resolved, then uh, I have Chris Kennedy, the Deputy Regional Administrator, attend. So I think it's very important that uh, we support those uh, at uh, that level uh, within the uh, regional office. So that's my perspective on it. So we're going down the line. Um, I, I, we have been trying to uh, support, often it's been at the Deputy Regional Administrator level. Um, I guess what I would say is that Yes, I think we can support those. We should support them if we're ensuring the content of the meeting is appropriate and focused. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to have the right attendees from both sides. So I would say it's dependent on what the agenda of the meeting is, and then we should support with the right players. I'm, I'm going to let it skip over Kathy because she hasn't been there long enough to have a rug meeting. But um, uh, it, similarly, in Region 1, uh, either I or my deputy attend the rug meetings. Uh, for, if, for if you're not familiar with what a rug meeting is, it's the regional utility group that uh, it's, an, it's an industry meeting, uh, typically of the, the licensing and regulatory affairs managers uh, for an NRC region. Uh, and they get together. Uh, the Region 1 rug, I think, meets three times a year. Uh, and they invite us to come and participate for several hours of their meeting around specific agenda topics. So as Cindy indicated, uh, there will be different uh, uh, senior inspectors or managers from the region that come for, for particular agenda topics. Um, but either my deputy or I uh, attend those meetings. And I think it's extremely valuable from my perspective uh, to, to ensure the front office awareness of the issues and concerns that, that the licensees that we are overseeing uh, have. Okay, there's another question on uh, significance determination process, and I'll just uh, throw the issue out and then I'll ask uh, again uh, any RA or, or Tim or Fatty if you guys want to take this on, I think, because I, there are two. Um, two perspectives on this or two viewpoints on this issue. It, the, so the question is, um, regarding potential findings that are greater than green, the interactions between the region SRA and licensees PRA analysts uh, that are open and frank and iterative usually yield more accurate, more timely results. And it asks, are we looking at that? And in fact, um, uh, in terms of one of the things that we're considering to make that process work better. So I do want you, someone to talk about the importance of open and iterative conversations, uh, both from an ICC perspective and from an NRC perspective. Well, I can start. I uh, fully agree that those conversations are extremely important to being able to assess uh, the particular finding. And I think having those open and frank dialogues sooner rather than later is a benefit to all of us in trying to get timely resolution. And, you know, it's important, very important on what the assumptions are and things like that. And, you know, we may not always agree, uh, but we should understand each other's set of assumptions going into the assessment of risk. And so I fully support uh, having those conversations, having those conversations early and in detail so we at least both understand how we're modeling it and how we're coming to our uh, results. I fully support uh, uh, the open uh, exchange of uh, information between uh, the regional uh, senior reactor analysts and the uh, licensees uh, uh, risk uh, analysts or specialists. Uh, I think there have been challenges uh, regarding when we uh, have communicated that we are looking at an issue as potentially greater than green and so the licensee did not appreciate that's where we were and so they did not appropriately engage their resources and then subsequently when we uh, uh, had a communication at a more senior level that we're looking at a greater than green issue that has resulted in the licensee then uh, engaging resources and evaluating the issue. And so I think we uh, have had opportunities uh, where we could do a better job as, as a, a regulator communicating why we consider the issue to be potentially greater than green so that the licensee can then uh, engage. And I would offer licensees should be looking at that issue as well and not necessarily wait for the NRC communication regarding that. But we have had a couple instances in Region 4 where I think we could have had uh, more effective uh, communications. and then. I have to acknowledge that there are, is variability in the uh, degree of engagement by the senior reactor analysts with the uh, licensee uh, uh, counterparts in, in uh, risk analyst space, and that's something that we can look at, and we do need to ensure there is consistency uh, across the re individual regional offices, uh, uh, and within a region and across the regions. There are differences there. Uh, from an industry perspective, we, we fully support uh, the open and healthy dialogue early on between the licensee and the senior reactor analyst. And uh, from a personal experience, the earlier on those conversations happen and the, early, and, and the more open these conversations, the better uh, we uh, focus uh, on the issue, make sure we bring it to resolution. And, they, and, and our goal is to really uh, safety and reliability and risk. Uh, so we welcome those conversations and also acknowledge that from an industry perspective, 
we can do a lot of work on our end to really open up those com conversations up front and we'll make sure that we get better in that area. Okay, very good. This next question, and, and uh, perhaps it's our last question, depending on how, uh, how vigorously we discuss this issue. Uh, how can stakeholders be sure of the NRC's sincerity about reducing resource expenditures on low significant safety issues, or low safety significance issues, when the agency is forging ahead on low or no safety significant issues, such as tornado missile, um, service life, and open phase, and others. So this is clearly um, directed at Fatty. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is clearly one that, uh, that you guys, gals, should take on. Our NRC, please. I, I can start with, a, I guess, an NRC perspective. A number of those kind of issues are active and current in Region 3. Um, I, I think we're all struggling with our, our ability to use our resources most wisely. And we certainly are looking at being more efficient. Industry is looking at being more efficient. And so I think it's appropriate that we ask ourselves these questions. Um, I think part of the difficulty is, is how do you determine how much resources to put on these issues? Because they still are compliance issues, and compliance is mandatory. I mean, that's the foundation of uh, our presumption of safety, is meeting the requirements. Now, we all recognize that various requirements have different impacts on safety. Uh, that's clear. So we're trying to figure out how best, on our part as well as industry's part, to use our resources wisely. So it is an issue that we are dealing with. We're trying to become more efficient. We're trying to find a way that we can risk inform that. Um, but we still do have to disposition <coughs> compliance issues. Well, I agree altru altruistically with we uh, need to disposition compliance issues. But when I'm at a site and I'm talking to the resident inspectors, and they seem to be pursuing an issue that, in my view, you know, clearly doesn't have uh, uh, safety significance. Uh, my guidance is I think there are uh, other issues that you could be spending your time focusing on that would have a greater return on that inspection investment in terms of safety significance there. Uh, you know, I, I cannot tell an inspector don't pursue this because, it, uh, you know, uh, ignore the noncompliance, but it's how do you spend your time when you're at a site there and what are you focusing your activities on? And, and frankly, you know, I guess be remiss if I didn't have the opportunity to say this at least once during this presentation, the juice isn't worth the squeeze on some of these issues. It just is not. And so how do you change that culture? Well, it takes ongoing engagement. I see uh, Troy Pruitt, the division director for the Division of Reactor Project, smiling. I know he and I have talked, and he's had specific discussions with some of the inspection staff, like, you know, hey, let it go. Focus on some other things that uh, we think will have a greater return on that uh, safety significance uh, 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 you know, that investment in terms of time spent. So I, I offer that perspective. Well, I think that actually was the last question that we'll have time to deal with. I do note that we have, uh, we have uh, three uh, additional uh, very intriguing questions. If the questioners uh, who didn't get your questions answered want to come up, or uh, please feel free to do so after the session. I uh, certainly want to take time uh, at the very end to thank uh, Joel uh, Rivera Ortiz for uh, helping us organize uh, this session. I certainly want to thank the panelists. Please join me in a round of applause for the panelists. And thank you. This concludes our session.